there we go well brethren happy sabbath uh it's a cold sabbath at least in this part of the world the winter was supposed to come at the end of december but the winter has kind of surprised us a little bit earlier so at the end of november it started on anyway so it's getting you know it's getting freezing cold in the morning uh, and uh, usually gets a bit warmer throughout the day but that's about it in any case we are uh, covering the uh, basic as i call it the true bible true bible theology or true bible doctrines basic things we are going to cover because that's the that's the uh, need we have we have to provide for all of our membership at the same time i'm happy to say that in the past couple of weeks we have produced some very good quality materials in english language and we're working on producing it in swahili for the african brethren and uh, chichiva for those in malawi uh, we have produced our statements of belief so now finally we have a, a compilation of of the bible doctrines that we teach and that we believe at the same time right now in the process uh, is uh, producing the booklet on the sabbath it'll be an 80 80 pages booklet <laughs> so i need to go through it uh, uh, as i'm going through all of our materials in english and i need to go through it so it should be hopefully ready uh, by the end of this weekend if not before it's 80 pages so you can just imagine how much work and concentration it does require at the same time we've already produced uh, other excellent stuff like a uh, very short booklet on the biblical principles on agriculture we've also produced an excellent booklet which calls which says steps to redemption and uh, again those are basic things that we must never assume that people understand and especially you people in the west must never assume that those in the east understand things you need to understand brethren that much a good portion of humanity has never really encountered the bible good portion of humanity has never really read the bible good portion of humanity does not have bible as part of its culture you need to understand that which means they're totally alienated from anything in the bible whatever it would be including repentance that's the topic of today have you really repented you know and the problem that's the problem with, with much 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 people in the east west and north but many people in the west also who have encountered the bible and who have bible as part of their culture uh, primarily anglo-saxon anglo-saxon countries have got another problem all of those mixed up theology theological schools and theological uh, thoughts all this mixed up theology in the west has 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 relativized has has made uh, has made the bible and bible teachings irrelevant and just confused millions of people in the west you know some of those termi uh, re religious terminology like redemption like i don't know grace law everything else like repentance as well it's all just all just all the one big mix up you know it's just like a, a pot that is being boiling with all kinds of confusing confusing contradictory thoughts contradictory ideas so people in the west are confused and fed up with fed up with the bible because they cannot understand it while people in the east and and other parts of the world who have never really encountered the bible before are really kind of intrigued and interested because it's something new but at the same time they're also exposed to all kinds of wrong ideas incomplete teachings and mixed up confusion of this religious babylon today so basically one way or the other we just have all we just all have a need for the education being educated in the core religious core religious core biblical doctrines brethren that's why i'm making a break from reading the book or the chapter after chapter of jeremiah and other prophets because prophets are probably the least understood part of the bible that's why we have been uh, reading reading them and analyzing them but nevertheless nevertheless i've realized that there are other core teachings of the bible like one like the one we covered last last sabbath was justify not just yes justification you know 
Then there is another term, redemption. We covered that in our booklet, Steps to Redemption, in English language. It's ready. And I've just distributed it to all of our baptism candidates because it just it describes very well the process of forgiveness of sin, justification, and how it all just works in a very simple English language that every person can understand. So, brethren, the need for education, the need for us to be educated in core Bible doctrines is 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 imminent it's it's imperative because we are to be the teachers in the world tomorrow how in the world are we going to teach people how in the world are we going to explain to them those concepts unless we ourselves do not master it now and and here so the hope of israel again as i said many times i don't want to have a bunch of dummies falling oh what a wonderful hope of israel is beautiful organization let's no 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 we don't need people to follow us because we're a beautiful organization or because we're a very godly community which we are or because we are this i want people to be godly i want people to be excited i want people to be enthusiastic but i want people to be also educated i want them to know why they believe what they believe and why are they true christians and why are they you know why are they part of the hope of israel the hope of israel has to be the hope of israel has to be a school a spiritual school brethren the church at, at large has to become a school not to become a nice and wonderful place where we all come together and just all kind of fellowship brethren that's a philadelphian attitude as far as i remember description in in the uh, history of the true church by herman hay of the last century oh you know uh, it's like oh, oh beautiful fellowship we have wonderful let's make our own little our own little social club that's as philadelphian that's a philadelphia that's not philadelphian attitude that's laodicean attitude and that's sadly what has becoming of various churches of God, you know, the the condition on those various churches. Oh, oh, wonderful. We haven't seen each other for a whole week. Oh, hello. How great. Yes, it's part of Christian fellowship. Don't get me wrong, but it's not shouldn't be the primary part. We've been called by God primarily in this last day and age. When so many people are lukewarm about anything, we have, been, we have been called to be zealous in preaching the truth and the plain truth. And perhaps our duty is even heavier now than it has been ever in the past. That's number one. Number two. Number two, we're not to be dummies because like dummies, we're not going to be entering into the kingdom of God. Brethren. We have to understand why we believe what we believe. We need to understand to explain to ourselves and to the others various spiritual categories, if you wish, which does involve justification, which does involve baptism, which does involve repentance, which does involve law and grace, and so on and so forth. We must just get out of this religious confusion of this world because the world at large lives in a total confusion. And sadly, many people of God who just keep the commandments, they have stuck, got stuck somewhere with the fourth commandment. Oh, we keep the Sabbath. That makes us so distinguished, so different, so conspicuous to this world. Brethren, that's not the point. The Sabbath, I've said many times, and I'll just keep pounding that until all of us understand the Sabbath is not the mark. <laughs> it's not the mark of the beast for sure, but it's not the mark. It's not the sign between us and the world is the sign between us and the eternal god and it has something to do with eternal god it identifies to god that we are his people and it's a sign to him that, that that's what we are so it has nothing to do with the world the world needs to see in us change our character changes our living sacrifice that that's what the world needs to see in us when they think about us when they think about us to say those are people really of integrity those are people who are honest those are people who will not steal will not lie will not do anything wrong those are people of honesty and integrity and yes we can trust them that's what we are to be known about not about oh they're sabbath keepers <laughs> they keep sabbath <laughs> sure we keep the Sabbath, but the Sabbath is not the center of the world. To many Sabbath keepers, brethren, the Sabbath is like the like like like, like the greatest achievement in their lives. And meanwhile, all of their other lives, the way of reasoning, the way of thinking, the way of acting, the way of speaking, 
the way of conduct it's just like like doesn't doesn't differ much from the world you know that is unacceptable to true Christians they have to understand that it's more and if we're to be the teachers in the world tomorrow we're to be educated about core Bible doctrines now and you know what I'm you may wonder why am I making this well I'm making this this a big deal because in all these churches of God you know they've got some spectacular sermons and spectacular messages and it's all great yes fine you know they, they would just speak about the current trends of the world and how we have to be different and they would quote the bible that tells us that we have to be different yes that's all okay but what about the core doctrines what about justification what about redemption you know and speaking of the fourth commandment if you would ask if you would ask all of these sabbath keepers who changed sabbath to sunday I just wonder how many people would know that. And of all people on the earth, we are to know that. We are to know who Constantine the Great was, the supposed first Roman Christian emperor. Roman Christian emperor. Does that make any sense to you? Of course it doesn't. He was a false Christian. He was the one who basically uh, imposed on the world all of these core wrong doctrines today. The Trinity, Christmas, Easter, Easter in particular. He was the one who replaced the true Passover with Easter, brethren. Do you know that? How many of you know that? And we are to know that, you know. And I felt so ashamed of how much I didn't know until I delved into the topic of, 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 of New Testament Passover. I felt so much ashamed of how much I did not know about the crimes of Constantine the Great against the true Christianity and true Christians. Brethren, it's shameful how ignorant we are. And that's why I've, 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 I've given my, myself a duty to write a book or, well, it will be a booklet, but it will be perhaps a little bit larger than a, than, than a booklet. So it might just turn out to be a book on Constantine the Great because nobody knows what he did. In my nation, nobody knows what he did. He's considered a saint. He was born in Serbia, by the way. And if you look at the religious calendar, June the 3rd is dedicated to Constantine the Great, Saint Constantine the Great. My word. In his hometown, there's a street named after him. It's called the Boulevard of the Holy, Holy Emperor Constantine. Brethren, that is a blasphemy. Because there is nothing holy about him, but my people, my nation does not know about it. My nation will have to learn it. And the rest of the world, then, as far as I'm concerned, is going to get a witness from the hope of Israel. Who changed their religion? Who, 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 who tampered with God's commandments? Brethren, do you realize how ignorant we are? And yet, so many Sabbath keepers, even in the churches, churches of God, so many Sabbath keepers think that they're so important, that they're so, 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 so educated, so elevated above the others because they keep the Sabbath. Oh, really? Oh, really? Please get that out of your mind. We keep the Sabbath out of love for God and because he commanded it. But it's a sign between us and God, not between us and the world. As far as world is concerned, I'm concerned that the world has to learn from us not so much about the Sabbath, because to them it doesn't make any, 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 any sense and any difference in their lives. But the world has to learn from us what it means to be people of honesty, integrity. Who is Constantine the Great? The world needs to learn from us because, brethren, we're to be educational force. And we're terribly so ignorant, yes. And, you know, until very recently there was oh numbers you know numbers oh look how many believers do we have we have this many this many of numbers and that many of numbers who cares about the numbers who cares about how many believers you have who cares about the numbers in any church of god organization what counts is what do we know what do we understand what example do we show to that world oh we show that we keep the sabbath yes fine and what what so what does that make any difference in their lives? What did we see different? Yeah, Sabbath is between us and God. That's our sign. 
and we should be keeping it at that and we should be of course we should be allowing the sabbath because that was sanctified from the very creation of the world yes that's right but again again and again and again the sabbath is a sign as it says very well in the bible the sign between us and our god and if the if if the fact that we keep the sabbath is all that the world around us know about us we have failed terribly we have failed terribly because we have to show them in action, in character, what it means to be a true Christian. So please understand the importance of mastering, mastering some basic doctrines. And what I'm preaching you today, I'm going to preach all of those doctrines first in, 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 in verbatim, in, 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 in words. And then you'll get a handbook with all those doctrines, you know, explained point by point and all those doctrines are important for us because we're future kings and priests in the kingdom of god and thus we have to we have to really master those things and we have to understand them if we are to be true christians because those core doctrines are the core doctrines of the book of the books brethren those are the things that the bible teaches us those are the things that the word of god is telling us and if we don't understand it then then then, 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 then then the miserable we are then if you don't understand it how can we be true christians how can we be spreading the true gospel by the way we have a booklet now on the kingdom of god being the true gospel so i'm just mentioning all of this for all of your listeners our listeners if you have if you have interest in any of of those doctrines Please write in, please send message. It's not like in the old days, you know, you had the, uh, what, what was the correspondence department and then you have to receive the physical letters. And so, no, no, look, we live in the 21st century. You can find us everywhere now. The hope of Israel is present now everywhere. You cannot say, oh, how can we get in touch with those people? Very easily. How did one Danny from Australia got in touch with me? He sent me a message through Facebook. Are you the one? Uh, I'm looking for such and such person. Are you the one? Yes, I am the one. The one person that he was looking for. Yeah. So you can send us, you know, you can send us messages through LinkedIn, through uh, Twitter, through Facebook, you name it. We are considering now to go on Spotify, uh, another social network. There is so much work to be done, brethren. It's, it's absolutely amazing. It's absolutely amazing, and God is calling more laborers. It's not in vain the word laborers, because sadly we we have had even uh, well, I'm speaking about Serbia now. We have had so many lazy people with us that you wouldn't believe. Lazy people who just thought if they understand something, if they if they just keep the Sabbath, if they just this that that that, that that's it, you know. People with rotten characters, we got rid of them all. We got rid of them all, I think, in the past couple of, or, or past month, and that's okay. I'm happy with that. So, the point is, we cannot be, oh, thinking, oh, we just keep the Sabbath and the holidays. Oh, how beautiful it is. We are so above the other humans, and look! That's us. We are your true Christians, our wonderful surrounding. That's that's totally wrong, brethren. We have to understand how ignorant we are because none of us has grown up with Bible theology, to call it that way. Have you ever grown up with the knowledge of what the true repentance is? Have you ever grown up with the knowledge of what conversion is? What justification is? What redemption is? Who or what is God? Have you grown up with that? No, you have not. We have all grown up in Constantine's Christianity. For us, God was a trinity, and uh, lovely uh, and, and lovely pagan holidays were were, were 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 when Christ was supposedly born, and and when he, he was supposedly resurrected, when he supposedly uh, got back to life, and all of that things, you know. That's why, brethren, it is more important because we have to re-educate the world when Christ comes. If we are going to re-educate the world, first we have to re-educate ourselves. And I've been putting emphasis on on getting true, getting true education, which is 
rooted in the Bible doctrines. And we have to teach people everywhere that because no, no other humans were born with all the knowledge from God and the revelations from God. No. You see, God called us at certain point. He might have exposed us to certain teachings here and there, to some of you who are younger or who are in the Anglo-Saxon world or those of you who are in Africa. But here in East Europe, nobody was from the young age or old age exposed to the truth. We lived in a, other totally different, 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 different regimes. And you have to understand it, brethren. And then I have to understand, you, you know, I, I said this a million times, and I'll say it one million and one time. If I say to you, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all of you in the West will say yes. You know who those people are. Probably many people in Africa would probably also say yes. They know who they are. But to the people in the East, I have to start explaining first who was Abraham, then who was Isaac, and who was Jacob. Because people have no clue. To them, it doesn't mean anything. In Eastern religion, uh, the, the, the concept of Jesus Christ dying for our sins is kind of superficially academically perhaps stated sometimes in the press when, when the big holidays come, you know, when Christmas and Easter come, and that's about it. But that's about it, and, that's, and there is nothing that people understand more about. You know, oh yes, he was born, or, oh, he, he, he got back, he, he resurrected from the dead, and that's about it. But brethren, the, 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 what's the purpose of his death? What's the point of his resurrection? You know, why did he do that? People have no clue. You know, even though they'll profess to be Christians. I'm speaking about European mindset primarily, you know. Eastern European mindset, if you wish. But the Western European mindset is not much different because Europe has always been dominated by the, 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 the horrendous and awful and bestial Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic teachings are just as superstitious as superstitious as uh, I'm looking for the uh, are superficial, superstitious, as as, as, as 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 dumb as you can get, with all kinds of rituals and rites that make no sense. And if you think that Eastern Europe is any better, you're much wrong. It's much even worse. You should just see the popular customs that people practice thinking that it's part of being Christian, you know. And all those customs are just as pagan, pagan to the core, and as wrong as they could be. But people do not discern that because they've got no knowledge, no idea, no clue about Jesus Christ, who he really was, why did he die, why did he come back to life, and so on, you know. Brethren, the world is ignorant, and we, Sabbath keepers, are no different. We're terribly ignorant. We have to understand that, we have to recognize that, and we have to work on that. We have to work on becoming educated people. So my question for you today is, you might say, well, why would you put such a, why would you ask such a basic question? Have you really repented? Yes. It's a good question for those considering baptism. It's a good question for those, it's my cat sneezing, by the way, so don't worry. He, it's a sudden, we have a sudden change of, of weather, so he's, he's coughing, sneezing, and so on. It's my cat Felix, so don't worry. No, nobody is dying. Everything is okay. So, Anyway, and yes, you may ask, you may ask, why is he sneezing in your room? Well, because I have only one room that I'm heating because I'm using electricity and it's very expensive. And, you know, I cannot afford to heat the whole house. So I heat one room and that room is like a refuge, refuge for the winter, for the cats and for myself. Yes. Anyway, have you really repented is the question. You may say, well, what a basic question. It is basic question. What do you understand about that basic question? You know? Imagine this situation. There is basketball, very popular sport all over the place. So the basketball coach was astounded because a player from his team had stolen the ball. But in his excitement, he was headed towards the wrong basket. You're going the wrong direction, the coach shouted. Stop, turn around, go the other way. But to no avail. The player did not listen. He scored a goal for the wrong team, you see. And just as this player was told to stop and turn around, God has told humans to stop and turn around spiritually in the Bible doctrine of repentance. We're dealing now with 
with with with true Bible theology. We started. We were talking about redemption. We'll be talking about salvation. We'll be talking about the about uh, baptism. We'll be talking now. We are talking about repentance. Because the ideas about repentance in this world are absolutely terrible and wrong. And the Bible points that out. And the Bible points out what is true repentance. That's the question. Hence the question, have you really repented, you know? But few, few understand what real repentance is. What a pity, brethren. Because repentance is our first step to salvation. Those who do not understand... Who do not understand, listen to this carefully, those who do not understand are doomed to continue, well they're doomed to, to perdition, that's for sure, but they're doomed to continue in the wrong direction spiritually and to ignore God's plain commands that we should repent. Plain commands, Mark chapter 1, that is, uh, if you ever think where to start when it comes to the preaching of the true gospel, Mark chapter 1 is the, is the place to start, because Jesus Christ is there in the Galilee, he fled, he was not in Judea, even though he was a Jew. Galilee was obviously populated by another popu by another uh, tribe, if you wish, not by the Jews, but most likely by the Benjamites. Uh, and uh, as far as I know, all the 11 apostles, excluding Judas the Iscariot, who was from, the, he, he was from Judea, uh, all the other apostles from, from the Galilee. The Galilee was populated by the tribe of Benjamin, and those of you who understand Bible history, you'll understand when the uh, United Kingdom of Israel got divided. There were only two tribes in the south, uh, Judah and Benjamin, and many scattered members of the Levi's tribe. And uh, the ten tribes of Israel, the ten tribes of Israel, stayed in the north of the part, uh, north northern part of the Promised Land, and then they were they were captured by the Assyrians and deported from that area. And then when you look at the German history. German history, then you understand that, that the same things happened. You know, Germans were just known for encirculating people, capturing them, deporting them. And then you think even from the even from the point of view of the common sense and knowledge of the history, you can really quickly and unequivocally, without any error, you can just conclude that the ancestors of today of modern Germans are <laughs> who else but the Assyrians. Absolutely. Anyway, back to the repentance. So Jesus Christ was in Galilee. Obviously, it was populated by another another people, ethnic, ethnically speaking. So Jesus Christ is in the Galilee. Jews are trying to kill him. He's hiding there. And he starts in Mark 1 and verse 14. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Here it is, what the gospel is. And that is how, he, how did he preach it? Well, he preached it this way. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. All right, so it's a very plain command that we have to repent. The same plain command, of course, we'll find at the, uh, in the account of the first New Testament uh, Pentecost, which is in Acts chapter 2. And uh, let's just see, in Acts chapter 2, we'll see verse 38. Uh, and then we'll take a look at verse 19 in, in this following chapter. Uh, verse 38, chapter 2. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, which is what we explain in the redemption, in our redemption booklet, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost is a diff is a totally wrong, erroneous, wrong, 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 wrong translation. Because ghost, as you know, what is a ghost? It's it, it, it's kind of something unreal, something that scares you. We are talking here about the power of God, and it's the Holy Spirit. So uh, I know that none of us uses this ghost, but every time you find you find it in your translations, just just kind of feel some kind of unease, and you should feel unease because it's a totally wrong translation. In the following chapter, chapter three, verse nineteen, we have another plain command to repent. And uh, 
uh, verse 19 says, Repent therefore and be converted. Oh, convert, be repent and be converted. Just look at this. Repent and be converted. Now, if you are asked how, what, how to explain repentance and what does conversion mean, how would you explain it to somebody? I'm asking you. But no worries, we'll have also one lecture on conversion. And we'll have a handbook that explains all of these things that I'm talking about. These things that are just so prevalent in your societies. You know, all of those religious terminology that means absolutely nothing because people are just superficial about things and they don't really need know what it means. Repent ye and be converted. This is command, brethren. And think about the implication. If you are not converted and if you are not repentant, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. Now, how can you be converted if you don't really know what conversion is? And how can you truly repent if you don't really understand what true repentance is, you see? You see, that's the implication. That's why you may wonder, why am I emphasizing, perhaps overemphasizing, the need for education because we cannot remain spiritual dummies, brethren. We cannot remain spiritual, spiritual uh, ignor ignoramuses, you know, and think that we'll be entering into the kingdom of God because, oh, we keep the Sabbath and we keep the holidays. No. We keep the Sabbath and holidays because it's commanded and because out of, it's out of love for God. Return love for God, yes. But how can we be the teachers? How can we qualify for that kingdom if we are just if we are just a bunch of dummies? Dummies who don't do not understand basic Bible theology. We must never allow that. We have to always understand that the school that the church, the church is not a social club, the church is a school. It's a school for eternity, it's a school for eternal life. We're to be the teachers. Because what were the priests and king, kings in the, in the kingdom of God? Priests were the most educated class of people in those ancient days. The only literate people. And God said we're his kingdom of priests. Well, we have to get literate, we have to be educated. Sometimes, yes, I know I'm just, sometimes I'm perhaps boring even with grammar. But I'm horrified with, 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 with some of the mistakes we make in English grammar. Forgive me, but God has, God has revealed his truth to this world primarily through English language. And therefore I cannot stand to see some of your awful mistakes <coughs> of native speakers and others. One of the worst mistakes that you all make, almost all of you that I know you, is plural in English language. We, we have seen it yesterday when Alejandro from Spain, right? He wants to say companies in plural, but he says company apostrophe S. If you say company apostrophe S, it's not plural. In English language, it means it belongs to something. Like companies system, companies employers, companies directors, something that is of company and belonging to company, but it's not plural. If you make plural, there is no apostrophe. And we cannot be ignorant, ignorant people about English grammar either because English is one of the simplest languages in the world. Trust me. That's why the whole world speaks English language. God, you know, just try to imagine the whole world speaking Hungarian or Serbian or Swahili or whatever other language. English is a very simple language with very simple, simple grammar rules. And for people to understand us, we need to we need to understand those things. But it's amazing, just amazes me how much even native speakers do not know how to say plural noun in English language. They just rewrite it as 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 as, as adjective. You may think it's not a big deal. Well, it, it may not be, but it's a big deal. Just imagine in the world tomorrow. Imagine the world tomorrow if there will be confusion like that. In the world tomorrow, remember how it says in Jerusalem and each nation will have its own gates and stuff. Imagine if somebody would just mess up the gates as they go to Jerusalem. So imagine if the tribe of Serbia just ends up in the in the gates of, 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 of the tribe of, 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 of uh, Guinea-Bissau. Or if the tribe of, 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 of Ephraim ends up in the, in, the, in the gates of the tribe of Zebulun. 
Can you imagine confusion? No, brethren. And why am I insisting even about English grammar? Because English is the common language we use to understand one another. And in order to do that, we must try to avoid confusion. We have to avoid confusion. We have to be, of all the people in the world, we have to be the most educated. Even though we were not perhaps born as the most educated, we have to become that. And what kind of education can I expect from you if you cannot even master some simple English language rules? So you may be mad at me for that, but fine. I consider that part of our part of our spirituality. I consider that part of our of our education. And of course that we have all of us who are spreading the word of God have to have a good command of English language. Because God used English speaking world and English language to spread that truth. You know, America is the strongest nation, the, the, the mightiest nation in, 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 in the world, still. Along with the Anglo-Saxon world, Anglo-Saxon countries, because they've got, they've, they've been very opulent, uh, you know, materially. And they've, you know, why? Well, because it was, it was the, it was the, because of the uh, righteousness of Abraham. And so, God has used those countries to at least preserve his word and he used those countries to start preaching of the true gospel he used America primarily since the gospel is being preached in English language then we have to understand it we must not allow confusion in our minds we cannot allow confusion about adjectives confusion about nouns plural nouns and so on brethren that's, that's, that's unacceptable to me at least And again, you know, that's a basic education, if you wish, in English language. Yes, indeed. Just like what we are discussing today, it's a basic education in Bible, true Bible theology. So those who do not understand repentance and conversion, repent ye and be converted. It's a command. How can we obey command if, unless we understand what it means? will come to conversion in all of these Sabbaths. Do you understand now why we have to go through these basic doctrines so that we, first of all, we understand, we understand it ourselves and then that we can teach those doctrines to the others who are interested and in the world tomorrow to all the nations of the world. So those who do not understand are doomed to continue in the wrong direction and they are just uh, ignorant about the plain commands that God has given us to be to be repentant to be repentant because it's not once once repented always repented brethren repentance is also a continual process just like conversion is just like justification is it's ongoing process we have to get it and not think, oh, we started keeping the Sabbath and holidays. Oh, we are so righteous and so above the, na the nations and so, so important to God. Well, I'm asking you, if you're, if you're a boss of a, of, a, of a company, of a business, of something, of a field that needs to be harvested, and you have a bunch of dummies who do not know what, what to do, how to do their work, how to harvest the field, what's the use of those people? What's the use of God do we have if we're just a bunch of dummies who keep the Sabbath and holidays so happily and make our, our, our congregations, if we have local churches, make our churches uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful social clubs, you know. What's the good? What what's the good does it do to the work of God, to the witness today? To uh, you know, what does it what does it what does it do to our qualification to inherit the kingdom, brethren? We have to understand for start that we are just dummies and so ignorant. I don't care how many how many how long have you been in the church of God. I don't care how long. I don't care about myself when it comes to that. I don't care about you because it's not the the, the length of of time you spend in the church. You know, I've had people sitting sitting in the same services with me for years here in Serbia, and then. When it comes to some basic things, they just blurt out such stupidity that I'm just shocked. 
those people who are just left but even some who stayed may still be very very uneducated but they need to be educated in, in all of these things that you are they just say some things and you wonder where, where have we been have those people have those people been learning the same things as i have don't they know there were future kings and priests because when i made one comment one of them said oh you're thinking too much of yourself Brethren, how dumb is that? I'm not thinking about myself. I'm thinking about all of us. And the part of our identity is that we're future kings. And that we have to qualify for the kingdom of God. Yes. We know that from the story of Jesus Christ, story of talents. And but sometimes you just sit and think and you just scratch your head. I, I scratch my head and think, where have I been all these years? Whom have I been Teaching all these years from the Word of God. So we're terribly ignorant. And some of those Protestants and others may know even the Bible better than us. In what way? In what way? Because they perhaps remember certain scriptures. They, they just twist it, of course, because they don't understand it. But they just at least know it's there. And in their twisted way, they are able to explain to their followers in twisted way, in wrong way, some of those concepts. So such ignorance about repentance need not to plague those willing to learn. However, you're willing to learn? All right, if you're willing to learn indeed, you're in the right place. This is a school for eternal life. The basic doctrine, to repent means to change from living our way to living God's way. As simple as that. Is that the way how you will explain your children? You know, in the past, we were just amazing how... I remember when I was ambassador of college. And the testimony of my very students. Oh, their, 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 their parents would tell them, Oh, well, you know, you'll go to ambassador college and you're going to learn this, that, and the other. And that discussion was initiated by my lovely... Uh, a wonderful, wonderful person. She was from Al Alabama. She had that Alabama accent. And she was, she was an English teacher, but she never was, was afraid, uh, uh, not afraid, but not ashamed of her Alabama accent. And that's why I loved her because she was a genuine kind of person, not, not pretending, you know, something. Plus, we, you know, uh, college was was in, te in Texas of all the places, you know, in Big Sandy, Big Sandy, Texas, howdy people, and all of that. That's okay. You know. And my Alabama English teacher was not ashamed of her Alabama accent. Plus she was very she was as far as I remember a very good uh, uh, example of of kind Christian person, you know. And she but she began one day she said I'm very, I'm very concerned about all of you," she said. "And I'll, I've never forgotten that, brethren, to this day, even though it happened about twenty plus years ago. I'm very concerned about you," she said, "because you do not have a basic knowledge of Old Testament, Old Testament characters, Old Testament stories. There are lessons in all of those, you know, in all of those lessons, in all of those stories, in all those accounts in the Bible, but you do not have some basic understanding of it," she said. And as soon as she said it, then started my schoolmates, my, 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 my fellow students began, you know, telling her uh, the attitude of their parents. From which I could deduce that the parents delegated to the church the responsibility to, to teach their children. They delegated it to Ambassador College. No, that's unacceptable. That's unacceptable. You see, we, 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 we had so many wrong, wrong things and approaches in, 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 when, when it comes to bringing up our children. Harshness is the first, the first thing that comes to my mind. You know, children are children. We cannot expect, I cannot expect your children to... I say yours because I don't have mine, so I can expect your children or our children because they are our anyway, because they, they are blessings to all of us. We cannot expect our children to understand better in deep spiritual concepts like conversion or repentance when they are of, of small age. Yes, we cannot. But through our example 
and difference that we make between us. Stark difference between us and the world, they could at least perceive what it is. And once they grow up, they will understand. So I'm asking, you know, repentance. Yes, here it is. I gave you very basic doctrine. To repent means to change from living our way to living God's way. Oh. Ever occurred to you that to teach your posterity like that? Well, they may not really understand what it means living our own way because they have you as a good example, hopefully, to see. And they may think that the way you live is the way how the world lives. Well, no, don't worry. Just let them go to public schools and they'll soon realize how different the way of life is. Just expose them to their peers and then you'll still soon realize how different <laughs> our lifestyle and the lifestyle of the world is. In any case, repentance comes when we see our sins and are deeply remorseful of them, stop sinning, resolve to obey God and with His help actually do obey Him. You see, that's what repentance is. Now, of course, the usual teachings of the world, most people, most people hold impressions about this subject that are far, 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 far away from the simple Bible truth. Some see no need for repentance because they feel they have not sinned. Because, you know, people just don't want to have, uh, they think that repentance, you have to constantly have these guilt trips and, and stuff. No, not at all. If God has forgiven you and 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 is and has uh, uh, ascribed His righteousness to you, as if you have never sinned, then what's the reason to feel <laughs> to feel guilt trips? Others, other people do not repent because they think all one must do is believe or accept the truth academically. Oh, you know, accept Jesus in your heart. So prevalent in your Western world, so superficial. So tragically superficial. But when you grow up in a culture like that, then you, you do not really you do not really understand, you do not really need that it's so superstitious superficial, you know. You do not understand that the Christianity around you and the one that perhaps you practice is so super, superficial and so wrong at the same time. That's why the hope of Israel has to be educational force. Educational force to tell people, look, this is superstitious, that's wrong. Here is what the Bible says repentance is. Many others confuse real repentance with temporary sorrow, remorse, or simple emotion unaccompanied by any permanent change. Oh, I repent, you know. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I accept Jesus in my heart to save me. And that's it. And their lifestyle does not change. No, it doesn't work that way. So all those beliefs, such false beliefs, brethren, cannot fulfill God's command. They cannot fulfill God's command, and that's it. Now, what is the Bible teaching? Well, uh, the word repent, of course, in English language and any other language, is actually translation, a translation from the original biblical languages of Hebrew and Greek. So the words from which repent is translated into English language means to turn. To change direction. In Hebrew it is Teshua. In Greek is uh, 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 Metania. Those two words used in the Bible. Translated repent into, into, uh, into our languages. And English language as well. Means to change direction. To turn around and go the other way. Oh. You know, such a change in direction requires one to first see that he's going the wrong way. <laughs> he's going the wrong direction to stop going the wrong direction and finally to resolve to go God's way and obey God with God's help. But a person cannot even see that he or she is going the wrong direction until God opens the person's mind to see it, you see. Because everything starts with repentance, brethren. But repentance, everything is their gift from God. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. It's, it's the uh, mercy of God that is the mercy of God that leads us to uh, leads us to faith. It's faith is a gift from God. It's the gift when we repent and are baptized, we get what we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
through which Jesus Christ and God the Father dwell in us. But it's a gift. Everything we have is a gift. And everything we have in this life is a gift. You know, and once and that, 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 that's how our tithing booklet explains. Our tithing booklet explains that all that we have we have been given as a gift. We're just like tenants. We're just using what God has given us. And he just reserved one-tenth of our income to be his. And we explained it so well in the tithing booklet. And I'm just going to summarize what we have, what we have written in that booklet in one of, one of these teachings. Because tithing is also one of the pivotal and one of the basic true part of Bible, true, true Bible theology, you know. And we have been, that's what we've been doing these days, you know. We've been um, writing about and covering those most basic, most important, most relevant, those foundational, those fundamental beliefs that true Christians should practice. So a person cannot even see that he or she is going the wrong direction until God opens the person's mind to see it. Now, uh, this truth that one cannot truly repent until God grants repentance so strongly flies in the face of the teachings of this world that many simply, many simply cannot accept. We cannot. I've just alluded to Romans 2.4, and let's just read it now, Romans 2.4. Bible, the Bible clearly states that it is not our will, but the goodness, as I said, of God that leads us to repentance. And that's how the whole process of conversion starts. You know, the Bible, Romans two verse four. Or do you despise the riches of his, of his goodness, forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? And then the Bible further states that repentance is something God must grant, as He did when He. As it says in Acts 11.18, when he granted to the Gentiles repentance to eternal life. Acts 11.18. But if you, to corroborate that, you could see with me, if you wish, Second uh, Timothy and chapter 2, verse 25. Second Timothy 2.25, which says, In humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant, the word grant, them repentance, so that they may know the truth. Brethren, God offers to grant one repentance when he calls a person to his truth. And we cannot be called to the truth unless God, by his and not our own initiative, decides to call us, as it says in John 6, 44, Jesus Christ's words, that nobody can come to me unless God the Father draws him. So again, it's God's initiative. When he wants to call somebody to his church, that's how he initiates, that he draws him to Jesus Christ. And in goodness leads us to repentance. And if you're listening to this, if you're understanding it and being convinced by it, then God is calling you and leading you to repentance if you will follow his lead because he never does anything against our will. The point of us to qualify for the kingdom is to build holy righteous character. But brethren, holy righteous character is being built by voluntary submission, our voluntary submission to God, God of Israel, as he is revealed in the Bible. We submit to him and let him lead. And if we do that, then the character is over time and through experience being built in us. And that is what qualifies us for the kingdom, by the way. So God doesn't do anything against anybody's will. So when God calls a person and begins to lead that person to repentance, he does so by showing the person that he or she has been living wrong. That is by showing the person his or her sins, you know. As when I was counselor for baptism, a minister explained to me, oh, God just opens like a jar and says, look at this. Look at this, what is in this jar. Look at this, this sin. Look at this here. Look at this there. 
Well, that's exactly what how he started the whole process with all of you, brethren, all of you who are already baptized, and that's the process he's starting with all of you who are not baptized. And since, as we know from First for First John three four, is the transgression of the law, God shows the sins by opening one's mind to understand God's law, which defines His way of truth. Just like if you remember, the Apostle Paul says in Romans, I would not know what sin is unless the law told me that is sin, you know. How could I know that coveting is, 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 is sin unless the law says do not covet? That's what the Apostle Paul, that's how he explains this process of opening our mind and God revealing his law to us and then as we understand the law, we just see that we do not match that law, that we are just, you know, we are sinning and that we are missing the mark. One who really, really understands God's law sees that he has not been living in accord, in, in accord with it, that he has been sinning and needs to repent, meaning to change. Brethren, we all need to repent because the Apostle Paul says in Romans 5.12, All have sinned. All have sinned without exception. All humanity, every human being in the world has sinned and lost the glory of God, it says in, in Serbian. It says in English, has fallen short of the glory of God, something like that. Brethren, we all have to repent. Every human being needs to repent. Sometimes people struggle with repentance, you know, uh, they struggle sometimes to understand the law, they struggle uh, with this, that and the other. But keep in mind, I said yesterday, uh, last night was, uh, I got, received a phone call from one prospective member in Serbia, we had like a three hour chat. And I said to him, I, I, I outlined to him the principle which holds true to all of you and all of your cultures and all of your nations, wherever you see the struggle, where, the, where there is a struggle, you know, you can you can be assured that God works with that person or those persons. And everywhere that you don't see any struggle, everything is you know business as usual, you know, everywhere, everything is kind of everything is like like kind of everything is fine, smooth, whatever. You can you can just rest assured that God does not work there. You know, I've been very, I've been very cautious about some people coming here, full enthusiasm. Oh, hope of Israel! We are very loyal to hope of Israel and all of that, all of that rubbish. And their loyalty, of course, very soon uh, becomes <laughs> very obvious when they, when they actually all rebel, rebel against uh, government of God. They rebel against certain decisions. They rebel. Well, in Africa, <coughs> that was very obvious. They called me a madman because I'm the one who chose our representative in Kenya. I chose this, the man. I said to him, I said, I know you're not perfect, but uh, as far as I am, as far as I could discern your fruits, discern another key, key word, very lacking, a process very lacking in the Church of God ever since I was member of the Church of God. I discern from what I can discern your, you know, smart educated well-behaved man and he was by the way since he was he was of the very young age he was exposed to the truth because his parents were the first ones called in that country and you know and he has shown through resisting all kinds of corruptive schemes and 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 and, 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 and wrong actions that his kinsmen use to cone white people you know for money he he has shown by his fruits that he is a true christian and of course such a man you know i uh, with such a wonderful background very good background and with a very good character i i chose and i said that he'll be the right he'll be the right representative for his country of the hope of israel and perhaps one day perhaps god willing we'll see god shows he might be even good for to represent all of Africa. Why not? As soon as that was announced to those supposed big loyal ones, you know, who said, oh, they're so loyal. They're so excited about the hope of Israel. Oh, the hope of Israel, the hope. You know, the new church, the new organizations. And I kept telling people, you see, you see the lack of discernment. We are nothing new. 
we are continuation of the old. All the good positive traditions of the worldwide Church of God, we continue. We are continuation. There is nothing old. There is no different way. You know, I had to leave our former fellowship, uh, former church organization because of various things that are not according with the Bible. They are not Christian as well. I was accused. Well, no, no, no. It was described as going a different way. No, I'm not going the different way. I'm just going the same way that I've always stuck to, and it's the way of, of the Lord. Hat Derek in Hebrew. The way. The true religion, brethren, it's called the way. For those of you who don't know it. It is the way. The way of life. And it's not that we keep the Sabbath and the whole world can see how we keep the Sabbath and they're just pagans don't keep. No, brethren, it's the way, it's the way of life. The whole world needs to see the way of life, which is different, which comes and stems from the work of God in our lives. And it's very important, I'm pounding that because I'm afraid that in this third world countries people just don't get it. They're just you know, their education system is 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 so superficial anyway they don't seem to get it they think oh we change we now keep different days that makes us so so spiritual that makes us so above other people no not at all we keep the different days because god revealed them to us because of his goodness and because it's a sign between us and him that we are his people but Haderek, the way of life, is something that we are to witness to the people, to show them that there is a different way, different way of life. Mr. Armstrong would say the way of give, as opposed to the way of get. Oh yes, we are a continuation of that philosophy, if you wish, of that direction. There's nothing different. I'm not going in any different direction. By the way, I've been, I've been labeled, these days I've been labeled by... by one person in whose service I was for seven years, who I consider now to be a false prophet. Anyway, I was labeled a, uh, I was labeled, marked publicly by name. But it's interesting how, and I'm proud of that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy when false, when a false prophet, you know, marks me. I'm happy. That means that I'm doing something right. Uh, but uh, it's interesting how selective he is <laughs> when it comes to the truth. You know. Marking me, he just mentioned all of my previous affiliations. So he mentioned all the various churches of God in which I was. Yes, UCG, and, uh, Church of God and International Community, and all WCG. And then he says, and then now, Hope of Israel. Well, sorry, he has missed something. Part of my previous affiliations was also his organization, CCOG, you know. Uh, uh, we, of which I was a member for seven years and which I faithfully served for seven years and on behalf of that organization I traveled, traveled to Africa and to Australia preaching to the people and strengthening them in faith and counseled them counseled various people for marriage for baptism for you know well that part he missed you know oh he's very selective he's, he's a wonderful he just he just amuses me how selectively he approaches the truth so he just named all those former affiliations that i was part of obviously to i guess to illustrate how i've chosen not to be philadelphian mind you but he omitted in his list his own organization interesting very interesting you know of course, I was marked because I'm telling him the truth. I've been telling him the truth all the time about certain things, about certain people, about certain areas. And it's, but it's amazing how it's amazing when somebody is so, so, so unrepentant and 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 stubborn. You know, I don't know what should I do. What, what do I need to? Uh, well, I guess perhaps the visit that our friend our, our minister terry nelson will have soon may be a convincing because he's supposed to have audience with very important people in the country of malawi i've been trying to con convey that the malavian government is so cooperative and so lovely and so uh, 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 favorable to us 
than the Malavian government because they believe we're true Christians, brethren. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? The hope of Israel is considered true Christians. They organized us, they organized stereo public lecture for all the leaders of all the churches in Malawi because Malawi has got very ecumenical kind of approach. And all of a sudden, all those leaders said, oh, what is this organization so important? We have to become part of the hope of Israel. Of course, they. <laughs> it doesn't work that way, of course. But nevertheless, it just shows you the level of trust we have, the level of reputation we have. And why do we have it? Well, because we have we have decried, we have uh, we have uh, uh, unraveled, and we have discovered certain people who, under the under the guise of true Christianity, are are are, are gaining you know gaining followers from themselves, gaining money for themselves, using witchcraft to secure and safe and and safeguard their 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 their, their authority and witchcraft is banned in Malawi by the way and that's why we have been enjoying incredible trust incredible trust in that country which has opened us open up the way for us to gain certain land real estates and will give us certainly open up the way for us to do much good to that little lovely nation if that's not preaching of the gospel brethren i'm asking you what is it in the meantime we have been we've been contacted by all kinds of people now from africa from rwanda from uganda from from you name it and that's what just prompted us to start producing literature john ovak from kenya insisted that we might make kingdom liter kingdom of god literature we did it and you know what is lovely about all of that brethren just let me just reveal a few things that might be relevant to you. We just do it as a team. Yes, I know I'm presiding elder, but I'm not acting as a dictator. And I'm not like the all-wise, all-knowing, all-powerful person on the face of the earth. Certainly not. So when John said, you know, we need kingdom of God literally, I said, fine. And you know what I said to him? I said, well, from what I remember, Mark chapter 1, I said, I remember Jesus was in the Galilee and he just began preaching the gospel and preaching repentance and preaching the gospel of kingdom of God and told people, believe the gospel. Start from there. So here comes John, so he starts something, then jumps in Randy, he just writes a bit more, then jumps Randy again, Randy says, look, we need, uh, we need, uh, what is the next topic we need? He said, well, I'm like, well, give me, give me, give me some time to think. And then in the meantime, while I'm thinking, here comes, he says, here is our draft, our draft, uh, 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 draft text on Christmas. Lovely thing. And the kingdom of God finally came as a joint effort and of course, all of those texts come for me to review them. And uh, I was thrilled because the Kingdom of God booklet is brilliant that we have. It's marvelous. It does, it does witness to the people about the coming of the Kingdom of God. But at the same time, it does witness to people the forces against it. And the Catholic Church is well kind of explained there as a spiritual or, or, or religious or ecclesiastical force against it. And I made sure, of course, to... Uh, <laughs> I made sure to attach certain adjectives to the Catholic Church. Things like pagan, uh, supposedly Christian, false Christian, and so on, because that's what the truth is. And then at the end, I was thrilled because I realized, oh, we are not only witnessing now for the kingdom, we're also witnessing against the forces against the kingdom, uh, forces who are in service of Satan, trying to deceive people and doing their best to deceive people. I'm like, oh, great. In our booklet on uh, redemption, our booklet on redemption is marvelous because at the same time it kills two birds with one stone, or as we would say, kills two uh, flies with one hit. <laughs> that would be the saying in Serbian. Because it does explain that God is a family that can be expanded, you know, with 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 innumerable innumerable multitudes of newborn sons and daughters and then of course tied with that truth is the truth that god is not trinity so in a sense we've covered two you know two topics in in in, in one book that's that's brilliant but the point is we do it all jointly we do it we do it all in in in, in total kindness to one another and in total full respect to one another you know 
regardless of the church hierarchy and the church government, which is, yes, we have uh, structured it according to the Philadelphian principle. So regardless of all that, we just work jointly. And the response in the world is absolutely amazing. The response in the world is absolutely tremendous. In Africa in particular, Africa is burning with thirst to understand the Bible. But you see how wonderful it was. We have a representative in Kenya and he could feel that pulse of Africa. And he kept told, telling us on various occasions, oh, we need a kingdom of God booklet. We need a kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. We need to explain to the people that the kingdom of God is going to be here on the earth. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. And there, yeah, we produce the kingdom of God booklet, which is which testifies to people at the same time to leave the Babylon, leave the spiritual Babylon of today. Redemption booklet speaks at the same time how we are being redeemed and also at the same time testifies to us and to the rest of the world that God is not Trinity. The Sabbath booklet is now on. I haven't been able to see it because it came came on, on the Sabbath, came on, on, on a Friday night. It's all already late and uh, somebody called me from other part of the world. So I stayed up until, which is usual for me now, I stay up until very early in the morning. You know, it will be 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. Well, that's okay. It's my duty to serve God's people wherever they are. And that means sometimes you have to sacrifice, at least in my case, you have to sacrifice some of your private needs, some of your private activities, some of you, you name it. But we have a booklet on 80 pages. To just, just imagine then how thorough the booklet on the Sabbath is. Not to mention we have several uh, messages, audio messages here on the channel, on my channel, Bi Biblical History. We have several messages on how to keep the Sabbath. So we have a thorough explanation. We are doing our best going to the ends Whatever ends you want to, we are going to the ends, all the ends, to serve God's people wherever they are with good quality messages, brethren. It's not a superficial kind of theology, you know, oh, you know, accept Jesus in your heart and do this, that, and the other. No. No, we are going to try to go in depth as much as we can to explain to people the deeply, to explain to people what the Bible theology is all about. And this message is part of that. And very soon we'll have the outline, doctrinal outlines for true Christians in which all of these that I'm preaching to you now is going to be explained well in a letter. So you can all read it, you can have it as your handbook. We already have, we already have one amazing handbook that we have made. We haven't yet put it in PDF, but uh, that's okay. Difficult scriptures explain at last. Difficult scriptures that are very hard to understand that people who are not untaught, unlearned people just twisted to their own destruction. We just have we have just covered them all from the Old Testament from Genesis to Revelation. By explaining, letting the Bible explain itself, because the Bible speaks for itself, by explaining what those scriptures mean, by linking them to other verses that just complete the picture. And it's a wonderful handbook. And why are we doing that, brethren? You may wonder. Well, we are doing that because we have to be educated people. You know, part of our repentance, and repentance is a lifetime process anyway, part of our repentance should be that we have been repenting of our, of our ignorance, of our conviction that because we keep different days, we are so much above the other people. That's about, the, uh, that's about it. Brethren, we are running into various uh, dangers that we may not even be aware of. You know, our Sabbath meetings can turn into social clubs. And it's a stern warning. I remember Herman Hay from the last century, the, the history of God's church, and he, he, he God's true church, and, God had, and he has got a summary of history of some important things and so on and so forth. But the end, the very end passage, the ending passage in his booklet is, 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 is like that. 
that the last generation of Christians will become like having social clubs. Instead of being dedicated to doing the work and stuff, there will be social clubs. No, I don't want to accept, I don't want to allow that, I don't want to allow hope of Israel to become social club. That's you keep that's you keep hearing me saying we have to be the educational force of the world today. Like we'll be educational force in the world to come because we have to re-educate the world. But before that we have to re-educate ourselves and stay zealous for the work of God. That's what God called us for, brethren. Yes, Christian fellowship is part of that. Certainly it is part of that. But uh, it must not take precedence or priority from spreading the gospel for a witness. So we all need to repent. And John declares plainly in 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 8, If we say, and now mind you, he's writing this to the church members, If we say that we have no sin, as so many of us may think, oh, we are well. We, we keep we keep the right days, you know. We we keep the right days, and we we, we go to to, to 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 services on the right days, and uh, oh, we we we, we no, we, we are not really that all that bad sinners. Oh, really? God never reveals to us all of our sins, even in the first stage called repentance. When John says, 1 John verse one, uh, verse 8 of chapter 1, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and truth is not in us. And truth is not in us, you see. We're still sinners, brethren. We are still struggling against sin. If you are no sinners, then what's the point of keeping the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread? What's the point of every year holding Passover services? Because the Passover is our renewal of our commitment to the covenant we signed with God uh, as we got baptized. Renewal of our, uh, of our acceptance of Jesus Christ's death, of his blood. That's why we take a small cup of wine. Renewal of our acceptance of his broken body. That's why we break that piece of unleavened bread at the Passover and eat it, brethren. Do we understand? Do we understand the symbolism of Passover? By the way, I've made a draft draft uh, 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 text in English, draft booklet in English language about the New Testament Passover. I wonder how many of us understand that one. Or do we just go through the motions, you know, oh, it's like a ritual. Oh, yes, yes. We eat, you know, unleavened bread, we drink. Uh, why do we do that, brethren? Why? Can you explain that to your children? Why? Can you explain to any stranger who would ask you? We have to understand why we do it. It's not only important that we do it. It is important, it's commanded, but it, it important is why do we do it? And the second question I would ask you, addressing the ignorance issue, who changed the New Testament Passover and instituted pagan Easter? <gasps> yes, Constantine the Great. Now you know it. And you're going to learn it even more once that book of mine or booklet of mine is out. And then I'll ask you, did you know this? Did you know that? No, you you'll probably say, no, we didn't. Well, brethren, for decades, the Church of God has been keeping the Passover. And yet so many of us have no idea why is it so important. And many of us have no idea that it was the uh, 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 civil power, Roman Empire. Oh, interesting. When just, you know, connect the dots, Roman Empire changed the law. Well, what will be the revived Roman Empire doing called the European United States of Europe? What will it be doing? Or do you think, oh, it will say, wonderful, let's protect the New Testament Passover by the law? Certainly not. Certainly not. They're going to, they're going to, to be forbidding and those who keep the new testament passover will be labeled as heretics traitors of the of the states of the european state brethren get it start discerning things we have been so much living in this Oh, let's make everything positive. You know, that, 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 that's the policy of some of these big churches of God. Let's not preach negative things. Let's not talk to them about the second exodus. Let's not talk about the great tribulation. Let's not talk about the coming slavery 
of the Anglo-Saxon people by the by the by the Germans, modern Germans. Let's not talk about this. Oh, let's be positive, you know. And so they give you these smooth and positive things, you know. And and what do you learn from those smooth and positive things? And speaking of Easter, by the way, have you realized? Have you realized, brethren? That's in God's eyes the most abominable custom. Do you realize? Do you understand that? Oh, someone will say, oh, you're making it up. Where do you get it? No, I'm not making it up. Go to Ezekiel chapter 8. Oh, son of man, says, says God to Ezekiel. You think your house of Israel, your kinsmen are so righteous and wonderful. Well, let me show you what they do in darkness in secret. And then he shows him one thing. Oh, oh you think that's bad? Oh, 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 no, my son, it's even worse. Then comes the second revelation, women weeping for Tammuz, and, you know, weeping for Tammuz. Oh, you think that's bad, my son? Oh, no, 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 no. Here is, here is the worst thing. And he shows them, he shows him, Ezekiel, who is, by the way, the, uh, the, 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 the watchman over the house of Israel. If you remember Ezekiel's chapter 7, when God declares him twice, I'm making you a watchman over the house of Israel. And he tells them if a prophet sees danger coming and does not warn the people, then the blood of those people who will certainly perish will be on his hands. But if he warns the people and people don't heed, then their you know their, their their blood upon their blood upon their own heads. Brethren, I don't want to I don't want to allow ourselves to have the blood of the Anglo Saxon nations, blood of the Jewish people, blood of all the house of Israel on our hands and on our heads. Hopefully, God willing, in several months I will be I'll be among my own as as I know I'm going among the lost Israelites. America, hopefully after that, Australia. Brethren, I plan not to have smooth talk and not to upset them by telling them lies. No, not at all. Not at all. I'm planning, if possible, God willing, I'm planning to remind them of Leviticus 26. By which we again are successors to Herbert Armstrong and the positive old the Worldwide Church of God times. Mr. Armstrong wrote... In the booklet that the apostates hated most, the United States of Britain in prophecy, Mr. Armstrong wrote about, about Leviticus 26. And he called it a pivotal Old Testament prophecy. It took me some time to understand what he meant, but now I know what he meant now. I can see now what he meant. Because now I can see things that he could not even see in his lifetime. Because we are living now in the last days. In the end times. And you know, and that makes me makes me makes me think how much that man understood how much how many things did God reveal to that man that he didn't even write down it shows me how amazingly God worked with such a human being you know and through his legacy today we understand even better somebody reminded me the other day my friend from Australia Oh, he said, because I was talking about certain things about the house of Israel and certain things that we have discovered that Mr. Armstrong never wrote about, like the river Danube, for example, brethren. You probably know what I'm talking about. The name of the river, what that river, history of the river, who which used to be called Ishtar, you know. And my friend in Australia said, well, he said, you know, Mr. Armstrong only said that he just discovered the trunk of the tree. Meaning that there were still more things to be discovered. Well, here it is. We're discovering more things now about the house of Israel. There have been books and publications and articles uh, uh, about the house of Israel. Amazing! That were not there in his time. And all those books and articles only prove that he was very right. When he identified certain sections of humanity as descendants direct descendants of abraham isaac and jacob but we're discovering even more we're now discovering there's scattered israelites all over asia all over africa did i tell you that the japanese scholars recently said discovered that the hebrews were part had took part in the foundation of their nation of course i have known that all along because the royal 
regalia, the royal symbol of the Japanese Tsar family, it's lotus, flower lotus. <laughs> the same flower that was a symbol of Solomon's temple. Oh, well, how much obvious can you get? But Mr. Armstrong didn't didn't write about it. Mr. Armstrong didn't write about uh, didn't 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 know that Daniel used to be called Ishtar. I discovered it in one book in Serbian about the about the Celts, because the Celts were <laughs> the original inhabitants of the Balkan Peninsula. Ha! Interesting, isn't it? Yes, we're discovering more because he discovered the trunk, and now we're discovering the rest. And it's so exciting, brethren. It just shows you the God of Israel is always has been one and the same God of God create God the Creator, the one who just has this plan, the one who has always had Israel as integral part of His plan of salvation of all humanity. Isn't that something important? Yes, it is. Isn't that something exciting? Yes, it is. Isn't that something that we are going to be preaching to the world? Yes, we will. And Leviticus 26, the pivotal Old Testament prophecy, will we be preaching to the world? Yes, because the fulfillment of all of that written there, as horrible as it is, is actually pertinent to our times. And it's actually pertinent to the house of Israel. In fact, to the leading tribes in Israel. And those leading tribes, as we know, are Ephraim and Manasseh. And we know certainly who their descendants are today. So anyway... If we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us. But in this presence of sin in us demands repentance. That's why I say it's a lifetime process. For God does not promise to forgive our sins unless we repent and are baptized. And the wages or the result of unforgiven sin is death. It says in Romans 6.23. Please, please memorize Romans 6.23. <laughs> please memorize it. If you would. There is good need for you to memorize certain scriptures because then, then your awareness of Bible, uh, true Bible theology is always there present in your mind. If you also see Luke chapter 3 verse 9, you will see why it is important, why repentance is important because clearly it's not a matter to be taken lightly. That's why I say please memorize Romans 6.23 and let's see Luke. I grabbed the Serbian Bible, by which I'll do in about... Less than an hour again, but uh, yeah, here's the English one. So look, you know, I'm just trying to illustrate to you how exciting and, and, and busy my life is when you have to think in two languages and just imagine how, how tiresome it can be. When you think we have to think in two languages, when you have to be switching over from one to the other languages, when you have to be keeping in mind that you properly express yourself and understandably in languages have totally different contexts and different uh, different ways of expressing things and so on Luke chapter Luke chapter where are we 3 verse 9 in Luke chapter 3 verse 9 you just add to all of this knowledge of of the of repentance and even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit, meaning those who are not repenting and those who are not bearing good fruit, is cut down and thrown into the fire. Well, that's how important it is, brethren. If we, we cannot be, unless we are repentant and converted, we cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Unless we just start working and fighting our ignorance, we cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So it's not only important that people congregate on the Sabbath to hear good sermon nice sermon about anything now it's important for us to get educated i want to turn the whole church into ambassador college ambassador was the pillar of our education in the old days we no longer have we don't have money we don't have ways to ever revive ambassador college today we all live pretty much making the ends meet you know some of us barely some of us more easily we are being exposed to these wars, rumors of wars, the, the, the Hollywood inflation. The worldly governments that just make our lives not very easy. We have no way to ever revive Ambassador College. However, no matter however, it was useful in the past times. But 
nobody and nothing can stop me and us from turning the whole church into ambassador the whole church needs to become ambassador college in terms of education and being in terms of constant education the problem is brethren when we don't repeat some things when we don't do something so and over again we are just prone to forget them very easily and uh, we're prone to kind of let loose and then and, and, and become slack in our in our prayers in our commitment in our understanding and therefore the whole as far as I'm concerned the whole Church of God the whole or at least one part of the Church of God hope of Israel worldwide Church of God will be completely as ambassador so clearly from Luke 3 9 we see that repentance is not a matter to be taken lightly but nonetheless many do not see the need to repent because like the self-righteous Pharisee from that remember in Mark chapter 2 verse 16 and 17 oh thank you God that I'm not like these other people and also not like this publican many people like that self-righteous Pharisee they do not see their sins and when one truly sees his sins in sharp focus he will be deeply broken about about them and hence repentance is accompanied by serious emotion and sorrow King David as you probably remember was deeply remorseful at his sin with Bathsheba and his state of mind is reflected in his psalm and prayer of repentance that's Psalm 51 you can just imagine when he realized that the God to whom he was praying and that God was Jesus Christ the God of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ by the way if you don't understand it go to my to the biblical biblical history on my channel and look the God of the Old Testament and please understand it the God of the Old Testament is one of the pivotal truths, and it was Jesus Christ yes it was Jesus Christ and the Bible clearly shows that so please get educated in all those things that you don't know if you don't know something you can always have ministry to ask if you're kind of feel shy or or, 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 or intimidated or whatever fine educate yourself the plenty of resources will be providing for all of you to be able to sit down by yourself read things study things understand things connect the dots and very often you'll hear me say brethren if you're in doubt about something first stop and remember stop and remind yourself what you know that is written in the Bible once you know that you'll be able to connect the dots even by yourself and there are other examples that we have of repentance like Job chapter 42 verse 5 and 6 you could cite them and I'm not read it because you know Job was repenting in dust and ashes because he finally saw his sin he finally saw that he just uh, you know it was nothing himself that he was doing that uh, ascribed him righteousness no it was all God's doing in his life and blessing him and ascribed all the righteousness and faith and gave him as a gift gift gave him a gift of understanding anyway so yet it must be stressed that although emotion usually accompanies repentance bare emotion or sorrow unaccompanied by true change is not repentance now Paul addresses that in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 where he shows the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow 2 Corinthians chapter 7 it's also one of those very good scriptures to be memorized or at least jot it down so that you will have it in your notes because the notes just like in any school any college any university you know people are taking notes of the most important points this church should not be different the church is school for eternal life let's just get it but you know people are not taught to do that because you know when you go to when you go to many places in the world like Africa Asia whatever you know people just sit down and just just, 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 just listen to certain things which is good which is excellent yes but they don't take any notes because you wouldn't believe that a large portion of humanity brethren does not know how to use paper and pen that's how I say it often in Serbia paper and pen invention you know part of our civilized world but people just don't use it because they think they'll just remember what they hear they don't know what they want plus taking notes makes your mind focus on what is being preached makes your mind you know makes your mind being focused on the topic 
and then you jot certain important things and then when you remind oh, oh, oh what, what was it about repentance oh what was that scripture that says that there is godly repentance and worldly repentance what was it and then you take your notes and then you see oh, oh, oh it's second corinthians chapter 7 verse 8 which says but i say to the oh sorry this is first corinthians i'm in first now let's go to the second corinthians uh second corinthians there we are chapter 7 verse 8 for even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I re perceived that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces, so what does it produce? It produces death. For observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What di diligence, that's verse 11, what diligence it produces in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, and what vindication. In all things you proved yourself to be clear to this manner. You see? So Paul explains that worldly sorrow produces death because it's only temporary. The temporary sorrow of being, you know, we are being caught. It's a type of self-pity or it's a fear of punishment or embarrassment. But the sorrow for God produces, it says, repentance to salvation because it causes a permanent change in behavior. And it leads to a person's becoming totally clear from the reoccurrence of sin. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that the Christians never sin and that there is no struggle against your old nature. Brethren, that's not the case. That is our all life, all life endeavor to uh, struggle against sin. That's why we keep the feast of unleavened bread to remind us that we have to root out sin, root it out from our lives and so on and so forth. Yes, the sin is there to be struggled against, to be, you know, to be fought. But... Uh, but, 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 you know, once we are repentant, once we have this power of God, the, the battles will become easier and easier, easier and easier until we finally come to the point of the first resurrection when we'll be totally perfect and we'll never again sin. But so we need to understand those things, that that's how it is. In fact, the change of behavior that accompanies repentance is actually the best proof of one's repentance john the baptist you know from matthew 3 chapter 3 verse 7 and 8 that he refused to baptize those who had shown by their changed behavior that they had you know brought forth the fruits uh, the true fruits of repentance but he refused to baptize those who didn't have those fruits and dogmatically christ says in matthew 7 verse 21 he stated that mere lip service, which is misna misnamed in English, believe by some, that it's not sufficient for salvation. Because Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who say to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Brethren, repentance is not merely emotional sorrow. Repentance is neither that, neither penance, because penance is an act is an act or acts designed to try to pay the penalty of sin f to, for oneself, such as by doing some good work or charity or, you know, flogging yourself for your sins and all of that rubbish, sadly, which is prevalent in one part of nominal Christianity. And all the good works, yes, they are necessary in Christian life. They do not forgive past sins or pay their penalty, for our sins are forgiven by grace and not works as we explained last sabbath so if you took notes last sabbath and you said well what did we explain last sabbath oh let's then you can review your notes and see it or you can just listen again listen to the message again and then and then and, and here it is but play then please get used to the fact that the church is a school just a school like any university like any of your secular classes and you need to be taking notes that's a very good habit that the Church of God, the worldwide Church of God of old, developed and kept developing in people's mind. And yet, it's amazing how much people just rely on their own memory, which is so f fallible, so so frail, 
that people just, you know, they, 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 they just come, they sit, they listen to the sermon, they go back home. And if you would ask them tomorrow, what did you, well, well, they might remember perhaps a sentence or two, but the core doctrine they would not remember because they didn't take any notes. So penance is non-biblical. And the Bible simply does not teach the doctrine of penance, and penance is in no way even similar to repentance, brethren, which God's word teaches and indeed commands. Salvation requires obedience, and it therefore requires one to stop his old ways and begin obeying God. And, of course, to begin obeying God, it requires, of course, repentance. And such repentance is toward God the Father. I've always explained to you that wrong translation. And to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's a wrong translation from Greek. Within the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because that makes sense. Your sins were against God. So your repentance is toward God. Our belief, our, our faith is toward Jesus Christ. Because we have belief in His, in his redemptive uh, redemptive uh, sacrifice for our sins. Our, our, our belief, faith is toward Jesus Christ. As a result of your repentance and your belief, the outcome will be that you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to be baptized within or into or in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're not being baptized into Trinity, and sadly the formula, baptism formula of the past sounded so much Trinitarian. And of course, I've reformulated it all, so it has no trace of Trinity at all. But it explains what I've just explained to you. Your sins are against God. Your repentance is toward God. Your faith is toward Jesus Christ. And as the result of your faith and your repentance, the result will be that you're given the gift by God, the gift of the, Holy, of the power of the Holy Spirit. Enough. So, such repentance, you know, is toward God the Father, as I said, who is the author of his law and against whom our sins are directed. And if you want a biblical reference for that, you can jot down Acts chapter 20 and verse 21. Acts 20 and verse 21. Testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Exactly what I said a minute ago. Faith toward Jesus, repentance toward God. As a result of those two, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, well, it's too late. Nasir, Nasir now saying wow. to the call. I cannot add him to the call. Can somebody add him to the call? He should be having green light. Uh, when I re when I send the call, he should be having a green light to which, please, somebody write to him private message. Tell him he needs to click on the green green light uh, of the call, and he'll be he'll be involved in the call right away. All right. Now he lives in Bangladesh, so why I can understand that he perhaps wasn't wasn't there when we started the call, and we're going to end the call very soon, but that's another thing. Anyway, so such repentance, dear friends, goes far beyond a mere outward verbal expression of belief, and even far beyond a few mechanical changes in behavior. Yeah, you know, you have those people who all of a sudden become religious. You know, praise the Lord, they, they become so exciting, and they, you know, waving their hands when Jesus, about well, Jesus and all that, they think that's, all of a sudden that superficial change in, oh, they must be repenting and all of that. Oh, no. Such repentance, you know, brethren, such repentance goes far beyond uh, the true repentance, far beyond the mere outward verbal expression, meaning it pierces deep into the heart and mind of the person and embodies an unconditional surrender from living one's own way to truly living God's way of life. It requires putting Christ above all else in one's life. Oh, that's something most important and most difficult in, in the world. It's easier said than done. Luke 14. Uh, we'll go to the chapter, to the Gospel of Luke, verse 14. Luke 14 and, uh, chapter, and verse 26. If anyone, says Jesus Christ, comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whomever 
Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost whether he has enough to finish it? Uh, verse 28, uh, we read it, verse 29, Lest, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin, begin to mock sin, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish, or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down at first and consider whether he is able to uh, with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still a, a great way of, off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. So, true repentance requires putting Christ above all else in one's life. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that you really hate your father and mother and your children. No, it means that they're just God and Christ and God are just above all. And hence, in a symbolic sense, by doing so, we sacrifice our own life uh, and we become the living sacrifice, as it says in Romans 12, uh, the first two, two verses in Romans 12. Another good scripture to, to memorize it. Romans 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Further, brethren, true repentance is not a once and for all event, nor is it synonymous with perfection. Please understand it. The repentance required before baptism is indeed a focused turnaround from our way to God's way. It's a massive spiritual reversal. However, yet even at baptism, God does not reveal uh, all of our sins to us at once, nor do we immediately overcome all of our sins. Because we'll be too overwhelmed if he did just reveal them all to us. We'll just be too overwhelmed. We'll probably just break down completely and then and, 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 and that's it. Just like when you go uh, to certain, when you go past certain services and it says out of order, you know. We'll be completely out of order, but God doesn't need people out of order. He needs people to constantly be making positive changes. That's why I said we're... We're just successful of the positive things for Worldwide Church of God. There were negative things in the Worldwide Church of God. And I'm not I'm not stupid, stupid, that stupid and naive to, to think that it was all perfect. Mr. Armstrong was a human, flesh and blood, a man, and therefore he made mistakes in various ways. Sometimes he's just rushed with some of his decisions. For for, for decades the church kept the wrong date on the the wrong date on, on, on Pentecost because it just misunderstood the Hebrew construction in the Old Testament. Nevertheless, God still continued to bless the church because the church was doing, it was the attitude what matters. You know, the church was willing to, to follow him and even though it made a mistake in how it counted and understood certain things, uh, it's just God still, still, still blessed it. Yes, there were people who wouldn't consult medical medical care and we had a <laughs> we had an interesting question from one country the most prevalent was should we use medicine medicine medical care and all? yes we should yes we should because if that's what god provided healing through among other things Yes, you know, and in the meantime, in the meanwhile, medicine has progressed. It's not only feeding us with with, with poisons, calling drugs. Uh, the medicine has has progressed with diagnosis, diagnosis, and then all these other things that are very relevant. And we certainly need to have this diagnose, diagnosis process that we need to go through to know what is really wrong with us. Helps us with prayers, helps us with treating it with natural remedies and all of that stuff. So yes. We use medis medicinal help and, and advices because we're responsible people. And I've made it mandatory in Africa that all of our members there have to be health insured because the uh, for some reason people in that part of the world 
are much more exposed to danger of being, 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 being hurt by robbers, by snakes, by you name it. But I've also made very sure and very clear to those people there, and I want to make it completely clear that superstition and paganism is not going to help in the healing, at least when it comes to snakes. The natural enemies of the snakes are cats. Cats of all colors, be they black, be they white, be they orange, you name it. Cats are incredible creatures and it's no, it is no coincidence that God made them and it's no coincidence that humans domesticated them. Cats can curb even the snakes. Is that what Africa needs? Yes. Yes, indeed. We all over the world need that as well. But I don't have to preach that to Australians because Australia is the country with the largest number of cats. Every household has got at least one, but more often more than one cat. But I have to preach it to the part of the world like Africa where the superstition is there. The cats are spies for the witches. Oh, cats. Oh, no. Horrible. Can you imagine bringing up your children with that kind of superstition? Rubbish. Stop it. What kind of God people you are. We have to overcome every... I don't care what is in your culture. In your culture, cats must be superstitious. In, 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 in my culture, something else might be, might be horrendous. Whatever is wrong in our cultures, brethren, we have to overcome. We don't have to overcome culture itself. Each culture has got some good stuff and positive and nice things we can focus on and practice even. But when it comes to superstitions and when it comes to paganism, all of our cultures team with customs of that nature it has to be it has to be all overcome. So as God reveals, we continue, you see, after baptism to see and battle all those sins over time, as we as it says in Second Peter three eighteen, we grow in God's grace and the knowledge of his ways. As God reveals his law to us and hence our sins, as we see how we fall short of that law, in other words, we must daily repent. That's why I told you repentance is a life lifestyle. The way, the way of the Lord, Hat Derek. We must see our sins, we must stop them, resolve to do right and follow through with God's help continually. Indeed, we must grow spiritually for the rest of our lives. So the fact that we change the days that we keep, that we keep also, that we keep the, uh, you know, God-ordained days, is just one aspect of Christian life, which is necessary, mandatory, but that's not the end of the story, brethren. We have to grow spiritually for the rest of our lives. And in the process, allow by repentant attitude that the holy, righteous, perfect character be built in us. But our obedience to God's law comes with help from God himself. No one can obey God's law in its full spiritual sense, in heart and mind, without his help. No one. In Jeremiah 10, verse 23, we have that very well illustrated. Jeremiah 10, verse 23. O oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. As clear as that. And this is because the minds of humans are brethren susceptible to the pulls and deceptions of Satan. <gasps> are we shocked? We are susceptible to Satan. Yes, we are, because we're flesh and blood. And we're just the embryo of the kingdom of God, brethren. The embryo. We are not yet born sons and daughters of God's family. So therefore, because our minds are susceptible to pulls and, and deceptions of Satan, we have to be extra careful and we have to use our common sense and we have to, we have to understand that until the first resurrection, we are still prone to make horrible mistakes, horrible sins, horrible conclusions, Horrible lifestyles, if we would just follow our own desires or all we wish. Oh, 
we will be just like everybody else. We will be hating others, envying against others, being jealous of others. We will be awful husbands and wife, wives, horrible parents. Understand that. And don't think that because you keep the Sabbath and holidays, all of a sudden things have changed, everything is resolved in your life. No. No, not at all. Without character, you're just equal to nothing. Without God's character in you, that qualifies you for the eternal life and for the kingdom of God, you're just, brethren, absolutely worthless. And your keeping of the Sabbath and holidays is completely worthless if your character is rotten. And yet the Spirit, the Spirit of God, which is given to those who have been properly baptized after true repentance, is more powerful, of course, than Satan. And being more powerful than Satan, it can, can and will give us the strength to obey God. <laughs> now that's the most difficult things for people in the world. To submit their will to God and to obey God because they always count that they are losing something. They'll be victimized of this, that. They'll be deprived of this, that, and the other. They'll be deprived of birthday celebrations, deprived of Christmases, deprived of, I don't know, deprived of being popular in the society. Brethren, but is that all worthy compared to the glory that's waiting for us in Christ? I wonder. So, just to give you a brief summary. The most important uh, scriptures that I mentioned that perhaps you didn't didn't have time, even though I'm trying to speak slowly enough, especially when quoting the scriptures, so that you can just you can just mark them and uh, uh, mark them in your Bible, or just at least jot down what they are. Mark one, Mark one verses fourteen and fifteen, and Acts Acts chapter two verse thirty eight. We are commanded to repent, which means to change from our way to God's way. Romans 2, 4 and Acts 11, verse 18. Repentance must be granted by God who calls according to His will. Romans 6, 23. Mark that. Remember that. The wages of sin is death. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 8 through 11. Sorrow that produces true repentance is far different than mere worldly sorrow Matthew 7 21 salvation requires obedience to God Jeremiah 10 verse 23 we cannot obey God without his help 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9 and verse 18 spiritual growth is a process and doesn't happen all at once Psalm 51 repentance is often accompanied by deep emotion it doesn't have to be but uh, it's not the deep emotion the deep emotion about what it was a deep emotion on David's part about what he had done wrong that terribly affected him. So some people are affected more, some people are more emotional, some other people are less emotional. So if you're not as emotional as David, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you are emotional and broken over what you have done. So in conclusion, brethren, the importance of repentance cannot be overemphasized. It is a first step toward salvation. Have you repented? Well, if not, then the shouts, the words shouted by the basketball coach that I envisioned in the beginning to the confused player are for you. The shout was, you're going the wrong way, the wrong direction. Stop, turn around, go the other way. <laughs>